This is Mick Elliott of Electronics Specifier at European Microwave Week. I am on the Smiths Interconnect stand with William Wilson, RF Microwave Engineer. And William, perhaps if you could give us a little bit of background on Smiths Interconnect uh, about the company and where it manufactures. Ah, th thanks Mick. Uh, yes, yeah, so Smiths Interconnect uh, has, a, has a great heritage of uh, high rail products and developing uh, components for space uh, and, and defence. Uh, we have a number of uh, facilities ac across the globe. Uh, namely in Dundee, uh, serving the, the, the European market and then we've got our manufacturing site in Costa Rica and our uh, design team in uh, Montreal and in Stuart. Okay. And are specific products made in specific facilities or, or does each facility pretty much fulfil the whole product yeah, line? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so we, we split it up. So we've got our design and manufacture facility in Dundee that makes our waveguides, circulators, isolators and uh, some passive components uh, for, for space and defence. Uh, we then have, in Stuart, we have our design facility that make our board level components and our cables, uh, where you can see some of our kind of mini lock uh, products coming out in, and our K2 TVA, and those are manufactured in Costa Rica. And then we've got our Montreal team that do the optical transceivers. Okay, and is it just space and defence, or do you do you look after other com more commercial a applications as well? Absolutely, yeah. We, we, we look after commercial, industrial, and medical uh, industries as well. Uh, but we see most of our kind of expertise and our heritage in both uh, defence and space. Okay, and th th that's where the research has been going in over the years more you know there's more happening in satellite communications there is yep yep yeah, the emergence of new space and uh, the like uh, more movement into leos uh, uh, and so we're, we're seeing an uplift in and the, the need for our, our components to be smaller uh, ha more high rel components high rel screening qualification testing uh, and and serving that that market Okay, that's terrific. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Hi, this is uh, Mick Elliott at Electronic Specifier. Um, we've moved across on the Smiths Interconnect stand into their little conference and demo room. And I'm here with uh, Alan McNeil, who is uh, Product Line Manager, and he's going to talk about UHF uh, transmit and receive front end. Alan? Thanks, Mick. Um, well, this is, the, this is the device here. It looks pretty large and it's large because it operates at a low frequency UHF and it comprises uh, a circulator so which is acting as a duplexer and a transmit and receive filters and this is an integrated assembly using our own components designed and manufactured in Dundee Scotland and it was uh, prototyped and this is the prototype for the coming generations of deep space exploration specifically on manned exploration, on manned vehicles. So for example, this would be part of the uh, emergency transmit receive system uh, on uh, moon rovers, for example, or Mars rovers, it could be, could be either. And the idea is that when the uh, explorers, if they're in trouble, and this is their backup radio, um, call me and get some help, that's, that's what it's for. So it's designed to be mounted on the, the active side, so the transmit and receive amplifiers. That's produced by our customer in mm -hmm. Italy. And together this would be qualified for the European Space Agency's coming missions, provided these can be afforded because they are not cheap missions. Mm -hmm. We're talking multi-billion dollar, pound, euro um, uh, moon missions. So it's, um, it's large, it weighs about uh, three pounds. Um, it's not yet at the stage where we could mass relieve it, take out some of the mass, mm -hmm. um, but that will be the next stage. At the moment, we are just trying to get it working, which we've done. The next stage is qualification to make sure that it will withstand the rigors, uh, dynamic rigors, temperature rigors, and the problems with RF power in space. Okay. What, what sort of testing are you going to do there? Because you. Good question. Um, well, we're very well equipped in the Dundee facility. We have everything on site, so we can we can do the shake and bake. And the shake simulates the the launch and the mechanical shock when the solar sails deploy for the transit to the planet that you're exploring. So it's got to withstand that. Then, then of course, when you're actually on the planet, the temperatures can go from 
extraordinarily low to extraordinarily high very, very quickly. Um, depends if it's in the sun or, or in the shade. So we can simulate that. We can also do the simulation of does it work in, in a vacuum? So when you're on the ground here in this conference room, things will work one way. When you put them into a vacuum, you take away the air, they work a completely different way. Mm -hmm. So we've got um, chambers that we can evacuate down to the specific, um, so 10 to the minus six tor, which is essentially a hard vacuum, and we can apply RF power because under vacuum conditions, RF power does really strange things. So we have to make sure that it works under the conditions that it will operate. So after qualification, so temperature, shake, bake, mechanical shock, and TVAC, we can say that this design is pretty well ready to go into production. Once in production, we will actually repeat those tests on a 100% basis because this equipment, when it's used, is actually uh, for the preservation of life. So it doesn't come with any higher, uh, you know, <laughs> higher demands than that. So yeah, that's what we'll do. Okay. I mean, you mentioned uh, working with the customer. Um, so we're, we're, this is all integrated at the Dundee site, yes? This is produced in the Dundee site. Mm -hmm. uh, the next stage is we would ship it to our customer. They would bolt it onto their uh, transmitter and receiver. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, there could be feedback from there. Oh, it's not quite what we, not, we wanted. It's not quite what we needed. Uh, it meets specification, but it's only when you start to join the parts together that you find out that we should have done something else. So there'll be another perhaps minor development phase and then we go into the production phase. Um, typically from start to finish that would be anything from a year to three years and it might be 12, 15 years until it's launched. So it doesn't happen overnight. So throughout the process of the pre-sale, the, the design manufacturer and the post-sale, you're in constant contact with your customer. It's, it's a long game. Okay. I mean, looking at the application, you mentioned deep space. Is, is I mean, it is an area that you know lots of countries are trying to you know pursue. Uh, is that going to drive the market for these products? <sighs> to, to be honest, it's it's not a huge market. Um, when you look at these missions, these missions are multi-billion, and the mission, the planned mission, the Mars recovery mission, where we're going out to Mars. I say we, the world, is going to Mars. I think the last ticket price was fifty billion dollars. So it's not something that any one country does. Uh, it t tends to be a global effort. And of course, with the situation in the world right now, cooperation is, is difficult to achieve, but um, it is a global effort. Okay, and the, I mean, there's things like the European Space Agency, is that? The European Space Agency is, uh, is funding this indirectly through our customer. We don't deal directly with uh, ESA, mm -hmm. but uh, we do actually get funding indirectly through our customer. And they funded part of it and we funded part of it. And the reason we did that was because, first of all, it's an opportunity to showcase the technology, showcase our capability back at the, at, at the factory. And also, it's, it's a really cool mission. Mm -hmm. you know, I won't be working by the time this goes and hopefully comes back, um, but it's, uh, I'll be watching the TV. Okay, wishing it well. So was this designed and developed in, in Dundee as yeah. well? Yeah, yeah. yeah we've got um, two two main components. One is the, the larger and the obvious, uh, the, the obvious mass of this device and it kind of looks like a car engine block and these are cavity filters. There's two individual filters there. Then this little device here um, is, a, is a circulator mm -hmm. and it acts to buffer both the transmit and receive filters and also to interface with the antenna. It uh, offers them a constant a constant uh, impedance, a constant load on the antenna. So it was all designed in-house. The only thing that we purchased were the little cables and the little cables were purchased from another company. Okay, and just without getting ahead of ourselves moving forward, I guess there is a a plan that where you'd look to redu reduce the size and weight, just because that yeah. is important, I guess, in space. It, as I said, it's, it's a fair old lift, I know that, because I carried it from the UK <laughs> yesterday. Um, mass used to be uh, a driving uh, requirement in space, but as the cost of space launch has gone down with um, people like SpaceX, they've greatly reduced the cost of getting stuff into orbit. Once you're up there, the mass isn't as important. But of course, you've got to drive that mass forward. It has a momentum. 
So for every, it used to be $50,000 per kilogram to launch mm -hmm. into geostationary orbit. I think that's down to about $20,000 now, around about there. So uh, very much cheaper. But every time we reduce mass, we reduce the momentum, which means if you're on your, uh, your moon rover or whatever, you want to apply the brakes, you don't keep going forever. I mean, I'm exaggerating, of course, but mass is a, is a huge issue. I think one of the things you mentioned was that this, you know, you can use voice and data. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, back in the old days when uh, the radios were voice only, uh, they were in a simplex system. So over and out, Roger, whatever. This is a full duplex system. Uh, we can get duplexing on this and transmit and receive because we've got this ferric circulator allowing that to happen. So these days, uh, voice is obviously still important um, if you want to convey something quickly, but data from the rover to the, the base, uh, telemetry data, temperature, um, astronaut, health, etc., whatever they're getting sending back um, would be come back through a, a data signal. Because it's UHF, there's not an enormous amount of bandwidth, but it's, uh, it's, it's what they can afford. So, final question, when do we think we'll see this on Mars or the Moon or...? Well, um, I don't know, I don't know. Um, I, you're probably talking about within a decade, but yeah. it's all driven by funding. The technology is more or less in place. Mm -hmm. All these things are being developed for the Moon or Mars, wherever we're going, but it's all about funding. Mm -hmm. These are not cheap missions. Okay. But this is ready to go anyway. I mean, uh, we're, we're, not we're, getting, we're getting on with the testing. It's, it's already at a TRL level above that, which the customer wanted for their prototyping. Yeah. So the TRL yeah. when you launched would be eight, nine. Yeah. For a mission, maybe a little less if it was a low cost mission. This isn't, of course, but this is already at a, probably a TRL four or five. Meets the concept. It's elegant, you can see it looks beautiful, silver plated, etc. Uh, so it's already probably close to being at the point that we can qualify, at which point we would say TRL 6, TRL 7. And then it's up to the customer to, to use it and launch it. So okay. maybe within a decade, but fingers crossed. Okay. Alan McNeil, thank you very much for giving us this, uh, that insight into Smith's uh, Interconnect uh, contribution to deep space technology. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thanks, Mick.